Hi, my name is Dave Newton, Principal at Regents Theological College. The video you're about to watch was taken from our Elim Theological Conference 2021, where we explored the theme of eschatology under the banner Mission Ready. I hope you enjoy it, I hope it challenges you and stirs your thinking. If you want to watch more of these videos, they're available on the Elaine Pentecostal YouTube channel. Or if you want to take your theology further, why not check out Regents Theological College at the website advertised below. Hope you enjoy and we look forward to seeing you soon. Not long after I became a Christian, I remember someone saying to me that I was now a witness to Christ and a theologian, whether I liked it or not. They reminded me that the only choice I had between whether I was going to be a good and faithful witness and a good and faithful theologian was whether I was going to work at it or allow myself to become a bad one. Those words have lived with me throughout my ministry and all who follow Christ are always a witness and all who follow Christ are always theologians to one extent or another. We can't avoid it. Maybe that's why the scriptures remind us in Colossians 3, 17, and whatever you do in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. Or in Romans 12, I appeal to you therefore, brothers and sisters, by the mercies of God to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your minds so that you may discern what the will of God is, what is good and acceptable and perfect. The Lord Jesus reminds us as his disciples that we are to be salt and light in our families, in our communities and in our society. Our faith may be a personal choice, but it is never simply a private affair. In the words of Jim Wallace, God is personal, but never private. And the Bible reveals a very public God. But in an age of private spiritualities, the voice of a public God can scarcely be heard. Private religion avoids the public consequences of faith. In particular, affluent countries and churches breed private disciples. Perhaps because the applications of faith to public life could become quickly challenging and troubling. Wallace continues, can the devotees of private religion ever understand the public life of faith? I should say that a link will appear somewhere for you, um, either in the comments or on uh, the screen. And you can pick up everything that I've say, I'm saying today, but in an extended version, I've written a paper around what I'm saying today. And rather than you end up having to scribble furiously, if you want to, you can go to that link and you will be able to uh, find it and you'll be able to download it and reflect on it and think about it. It's also the basis of a, a slightly longer academic paper that I'll be presenting a little bit later on in the year. If we reject the dichotomized view that separates our personal faith from our public life, then it seems clear to me that this doesn't only have an impact on those that we pastor, it also has an impact on who we are as pastors and what we do as pastors. The calling of the pastor herself becomes one that must be considered by asking whether she is seeking to be a good and faithful witness in the world and a good and faithful theologian. Not only are we to understand our own roles in the light of Paul's explanation to the Ephesians around the gifts to the body in Ephesians chapter 4, we understand that our lives become a theological and public witness statement too. As Paul says to the believers in Corinth about the fruit of his own ministry, in 2 Corinthians 3, about the congregation, he says, you yourselves are our letter written on our hearts to be known and read by all. And you know that you are a letter of Christ prepared by us, written not with ink, but with the spirit of the living God, not on tablets of stone, but on tablets of human hearts. So we as pastors are also written letters upon which God can say something to the world, to the community around us. When Paul writes to Timothy, the young pastor in Ephesus, he says this in 1 Timothy chapter 4, set the believers an example in speech, in conduct, in love, in faith and in purity. Our lives 
and our ministries as pastors are irrevocably linked. Just like all believers, we need to give attention to our witness and to our theological convictions. But there's something significant about us as pastors doing that because we are under shepherds of the great shepherd. What we say, how we live and how we pastor are themselves witnesses to Christ. Let me give you some examples of how you might reflect on that. Consider with me the following six simple pictures. Number one, how you responded to the recent images of the storming of the Capitol building in Washington DC, particularly the images of banners with Jesus written on them, or the images or the video footage of those who used the Lord's Prayer in the chamber and prayed and shouted and held um, uh, plastic ties and all of those things. Consider particularly the way in which some parts of the Christian witness in the US and beyond have allowed themselves to become subservient to particular constructs of nationalism and eschatology. And I know we're picking up eschatology later, so I don't want to say too much about it now. And the relationship between the church and the state. And think of the impact of both those pastors who have admitted this and apologized for it, and those who have dismissed it or re-narrated their own involvement with it. Secondly, consider the impact of the public witness of the gospel, of the prolonged silence from pastors and church leaders in recent child abuse controversies across the world. Thirdly, consider how leaders have responded to issues of race in recent years as pastors and church leaders, and the potential negative or positive impact their choices and their words could have on the community's trust of the church and our mission and our message. But then consider this, the remarkable impact of the eulogy that was delivered in April 2019 at the funeral of a young Irish journalist called Lyra McKee. The officiant, a personal friend of mine, was Father Martin McGill. When he asked the collected dignitaries, friends and family who were attending Lyra's funeral, why it took the death of a 29 year old woman to get them to talk to one another. His, mar his remarks received a standing ovation that rippled from the back of the cathedral to the front and confronted the politicians who were there with their own failures. They were the last to stand and they did so very sheepishly. But that ripple then rippled out into the world. It could be argued that what he said was the last part of the catalyst that brought those same politicians around a table and saw the assembly at Stormont recommenced. Or consider the impact of the speech that Todd has just talked about, delivered on the 20th of August 1963 by Martin Luther King on the steps of the Capitol, and how that impacted the world and American society. Or lastly, the election of Reverend Raphael Warnock, who now occupies the pulpit that uh, Luther King once did, to the US Senate in Georgia as its first black senator. Interestingly, when you look at his Twitter feed, he describes himself as uh, Reverend Warnock, and then he says this, this is his words, not my, these are his words, not mine. Pastor, advocate, Savannah born and raised, Senator for Georgia, in that order. The public witness of pastors can be good or bad, but it cannot be ignored. Our communities of faith look to us for guidance, for instruction, for example, and for assurance. They need us to help them through what it means to live an authentic and a faithful life in a rapidly changing world. And at this moment, in our world with so many figures of stability and trust shaken, and so much uncertainty swirling around us, who we are and what we do is of the utmost importance. In the words of Ralph Waldo Emerson, what you are stands over you the while and thunders so that I cannot hear what you say to the contrary. So let me talk to you for a moment about what that might mean. Leslie Newbiggin, a famous missiologist and a wonderful, wonderful follower of Christ, um, once talked about us being public spires in the public square. I don't have the time to unpack fully the challenges and the opportunities that a reimagined understanding of the role of the pastor as a public witness might be. I'm currently looking at the way in which pastoring itself and is perceived and assessed and thought through in the public square in an academic context. And there's too much for me to try and unpack here. But let me just say this, um, 
There is much written and there's much debated about what we do as social activists, as political lobbyists, as community champions, as those who seek to walk the corridors of power. And I'll return to some of those in a moment. But there's much less said, written or explored about the significance of pastoring itself as a public witness. Indeed, it's hard to find a commonly held view of what the outcomes and the outputs of effective pastoring and faithful shepherding actually are. Whilst we have criteria for most other areas of public life, they don't seem to exist in abundance for those of us who are pastors. We have lost the importance of the contribution of pastoral life to the public square at our peril. If we are not careful, we'll become complicit in reimagining pastoral leadership so much that we remove from it the fundamental call to serve Christ and his church through helping people respond to his grace and live in faithful and joyful obedience to his purposes for the world in accordance with the teaching of scripture and in the strength of the Holy Spirit. For what it's worth, my baseline definition of the pastoral task is to seek Christ, to see Christ formed faithfully in those whom we lead and to help them to live in the purposes of God for their lives. Pastoral ministry in its fullest and its most creative forms has been pushed right back to the top of the agenda for us by this pandemic. I would add to Todd's four definers, that issue, pastoring faithfully. In years to come, those we seek to lead will not remember how many sermons we posted online, how many times our technology didn't work, or how many great videos we found for our gatherings. They will, however, remember whether or not we loved them, spoke to them, prayed with them, or simply allowed ourselves to be present to them as physical reminders of the ongoing promises of God and the ongoing presence of Christ. Tim Keller has suggested that in a smaller church, your pastoring sets up your preaching, but in a larger church, your preaching sets up your pastoring. We, sisters and brothers, as pastors are called to be part of the community of faith, and this part of being a public spire in the public square is absolutely vital. What does it mean then to be a public witness as a pastor? Well, let me try to highlight just five key distinctives that might help us in this before I then draw back to ask a closing question. Firstly, our, past, our public witness as a prophetic voice. Secondly, our public witness in prayer. Thirdly, our public witness in preaching. Fourthly, our public witness in presence. And lastly, our public witness in pastoring itself. The pressing issues in Northern Ireland will not always be the same as those in Scotland, England or Wales. The issues faced pastorally in a global movement like Elam are diverse and complex. I'm therefore delighted that the, uh, the, the pastoral and public theology task force that Elam has set up and I have the privilege of uh, facilitating will be trying to grapple with this issue and we need your help regionally and nationally as we think through how we can prepare support and help pastors like you and pastors like me to serve faithfully and effectively. It's a challenge, but I think it's a good step and I welcome it very much. Let me reflect then, first of all, as our, with our witnesses, pastors, as a prophetic voice. Notwithstanding the aspect, aspects of our eschatological ministry that both Simo and Martin will highlight for us later, we are called to speak truth to power. To put it colloquially, we are called to be in the presence of power as ambassadors for Christ, as women and men who are citizens of heaven, and to understand our ministries in the light of eternity and filtered through the call to be faithful to Christ above everything else, but never to be in the pockets of power. When we become intoxicated by power or pawns in the hands of political parties, we not only dull our own witness, but we also become a bad witness. One need, one need only think of the impact of the church's subservience to their political masters during the Nazi dictatorship in Germany to be reminded of the devastating impact of allowing ourselves to become bit players in the politics of nationalism. The Barman Declaration's six-point opposition to that capitulation to Nazism still stands as a powerful example of what it means to be prophetic. And perhaps it helps us today to identify some of the key components 
of what a prophetic stance in our own day might look like. Here's my rough scar starting guide based on the Barman Declaration. Number one, that Christ as revealed to us through the word of God is the supreme revelation of God to us. Any contemporary power or political posturing that claims to be Christian but contradicts him should be refute, refuted. Secondly, that Christ's authority and example for our own moral and ethical life holds central place in the church as the people of God. Any moral expectation placed upon us that contradicts his example is to be honoured only in so far as it does, does not place our allegiance to him in jeopardy. Thirdly, politics and political expectations and statements will never be given priority over Christ's view of the world or human beings. Fourthly, no political leader can demand the obedience of the church. Christ alone is the Lord and ultimately he is the Lord of the whole earth. Fifthly, there should be a separation of power between church and state which does not impinge upon the dignity and calling of either the church or the state. And lastly, we will not subordinate the church to the state or the word of God to the power of God or the power of God's spirit to the church. The word of God is our ultimate authority and we are members of God's body before we are members of anything else. Such a position, although not perfect, offers a space for us as pastors to discuss nationalism, the dignity of people, and it creates a space where we can speak truth to power without being held ransom by power. It depends, however, upon a pastorate that is already committed to Christ. After all, we cannot be held ransom by anything else if we are already captivated by Jesus. Such a position frees us to be his firsts. In the words of Thomas Merton, when speech is in danger of perishing or being perverted in the amplified noise of beasts, perhaps it becomes obligatory for a monk to try to speak. In other words, when the noise around us is filled with so much political posturing, we must remember first and foremost whose we are and who we are. Secondly, I want to think about our public witness in prayer. In his 55 Theses at the end of the pastor as public theologian, Kevin Van Husser reminds us that the public witness of the pastor is of vital significance. In Thesis 21, he remembers and reflects on Jonathan Edwards, the great revivalist. Jonathan Edwards, he says, saw the pastorate as a divine business, a participation in Christ's work of representing God to human beings, especially through preaching, and of human beings to God, especially through prayer. The responsibility of the pastor to be both a person of prayer themselves and to lead the community of God in prayer is vital for our public witness. To root ourselves and our communities in prayer is a public statement, it's a declaration that our strength lies in God and not in ourselves. It is a reminder written in our liturgy and in our common life that the answers to our problems lie beyond us and in Christ. It is a profoundly countercultural declaration of dependency and of humility. It's an act of confrontation with the popular modern notion that we do not need help. I wonder if we have lost this vital aspect of pastoring. The call not only to be a praying person, but to lead a praying community and to understand that this praying community in praying is itself a witness. I know that in my own preparation for preaching and teaching, I can often spend as much time crafting my prayers during and at the end of the service and of the message as I can the message itself. It is the space where our confession that God is the one whom we need becomes enfleshed in our own ministries. Have we allowed ourselves to forget that without him we can do nothing? Thirdly, our public witness as pastors in preaching. Jonathan Edwards' view applies equally to preaching as it does to praying. Our preaching is not only the preaching of what we often call a gospel message, but also the preaching of the whole counsel of God. To do this is there an inherent acknowledgement that the truth of God's word defines our understanding of the world and our place in it. It's to accept and to recognise that pastors are theologians whose calling is to use words rooted in holy writ to help those we lead and to challenge the societies of which we are part and to remind them that what God has done, is doing and will do through Christ is the axis of history. I don't mean by this that we become spiritual extensions of one party, such as the danger of some aspects of North American evangelicalism. 
nor do I mean that we become a community of leaders on the edge of culture with no place in public life like continental Europe so often is. The point I'm trying to make here is that we see preaching and proclamation as a core way of explaining what it means to be human to our own congregations and to the world, what it means to have a healthy community and what our ultimate purpose is. Our public witness and preaching means, therefore, that the messages we preach, the curricula that we develop, seek to speak into the culture where we find ourselves whilst remaining rooted in God's word. We are in Christ first and we are in this system of things, but not of it. We are called, in short, to communicate through preaching Christ to everyone, everywhere and always. There's a particular challenge around how we do this faithfully in a pluralistic context without displaying arrogance. I would suggest that Francis Schaeffer's model of co-belligerence or um, Miroslav Volf's work around co-relationality might be interesting to explore. Fourthly, our public witness and presence. By this, I mean we are called to be the hands and the feet of Christ through engagement with our communities, the societies where God has placed us and the world where God has us. We don't run away from the world or lock ourselves away from its challenges. We embrace the call to be the hands and feet of Jesus in our world, meeting people where they are, serving them where they are and doing good to all, especially to those who are of the household of faith. In the words of Alan Roxburgh and Fred Romanuk, mission is not about a project or a budget or a one-off event somewhere. It's not even about sending missionaries. A missional church is a community of God's people who live into the imagination of what they are by their very virtue. God's missionary people living as a demonstration of what God plans to do in and for all of the creation through Christ. We are his hands and feet into our culture. Richard Niebuhr's work on Christ and culture, first published in 1956 and critiqued many times since, sets out five challenges around how we engage with our culture. But I wonder if we need to examine that again today and think about how we engage with a culture which is constantly changing and make sure that we are faithful to the communities that we find ourselves in today, not faithful to the communities that existed 50 years ago. And fifthly, our public witness in pastoring. This is my last point. How do we actually pastor in a way that has a missional purpose? The way in which we walk with women and men, instruct the faithful, reach out to the world, care for the sick, visit those in prison, encourage the faint-hearted, shepherd the flock of God, becomes in and of itself a witness to the world. I have a hunch that this is an area of ministry that has been pushed right back to the top of our agendas. I think there's a gap here that we need to think about. We need to celebrate pastoring again. Our communities watch how we treat people. They notice when we don't notice them. Stories of care or lack of it spread quickly. If we put pre projects and prestige above people and their lives, then the community will see it. Perhaps that is why we are reminded by Jesus that people will know us and know that we are his by how much we love one another. I'd want to just say that I think that it is vitally important that our public witness as public servants and leaders uh, is commensurate with the dignity and the value of the office. And I would point you to uh, Nolan's seven principles of public life here in the United Kingdom as a good start for how our public posture should be as pastors. They are the values of selflessness, integrity, objectivity, accountability, openness, honesty, and leadership. So here's my question as this all is drawn to a close. What's the distinctive Pentecostal witness for us as pastors as a public witness? How do we as Pentecostals work out what it means to be prophetic, to be in prayer, to see our preaching and our presence and our pastoring as a strong and beautiful reminder of the presence and the grace of God? Perhaps I wanna leave you with this question. Our founders, our fathers and our mothers, those who birthed this movement spoke into a culture that navigated the First World War, the Spanish flu epidemic, the Great, um, the, the Great Depression, the Irish Civil War, the Irish War of Independence and the Second World War. They responded to crises after crises with a verve and a passion around the idea of a four square gospel of Christ as our savior, our healer, our baptizer and our coming king. Now is the time I would suggest for us to think about what it looks like to move from that pietistic understanding of saviour, healer, baptizer, and coming king, which is still vitally important, to the public witness of the Pentecostal church, 
where communities can be transformed by Christ as saviour, transformed and empowered by Christ as the um, baptizer, renewed and strengthened and living under his leadership and demonstrating the public witness of what it means to be his hands and feet. What if we were to give ourselves to this noble task once again in such a way that we proclaim the gospel, serve the poor, engage with our communities and lead our churches into a mission that touches every part of our society, speaks into every strata of our community and reaches every corner of the earth? What if this is the age of a Pentecostalism that spends itself on behalf of the poor and the hungry, challenges systemic injustice and offers the excluded and the forgotten a vision of the world and themselves where God can use them wherever they are to further his kingdom? Perhaps we have come to the kingdom for such a time as this. <laughs>